Deirdre McClowski, an economist, historian, and transgender woman with an inspiring biography and an incredible talent with the written word, argues that capitalism, or as she's retitled it, innovism, makes us better people. The evidence of the last 200 years is very clear that it at least makes us richer, but McClowski argues that with this wealth comes an acceptance of the bourgeois virtues which are really what enriches us as human beings. You may be more familiar with the seven deadly sins, but there are also seven virtues, courage, temperance, justice, prudence, faith, hope, and love. In a capitalist society, courage is competition, trying to outdo a rival not by committing violence against them, but in outthinking them. Also, mock it if you'd like, but today courage is shown through identity, the courage to come out, to transition, to speak bravely for oneself, and oppose intolerance. We learn temperance through savings and interest, and restraint only has meaning when gluttony is possible. Capitalism has taught us the value of human life. Remember, it was only after we got rich that we outlawed slavery and fought for hum universal human rights. Prudence, of course, is the virtue of commerce, of wise calculation and good business. We have much more faith in each other with capitalism. Capitalism encourages trust in sellers and in buyers across social, national, racial, and political lines. In the past, you would never trust someone from another town for anything. Credit could never work in the past, but it does now because we have a great deal more faith in each other and each other's potential. The only hope people of the past had was for a good death and passage into heaven. Hope is now the lifeblood of our economy, a belief in the possibility of self-improvement, betterment, and a life well lived. And no society has had as much love in it as ours. No more arranged marriages made for political and economic reasons. No more women as property. We marry for love now because we're rich enough to do so. And we can espouse the power of love because we can back it up with industry. McClowski writes, the richer, more urban, more bourgeois people, one person averaged with another, I claim have larger, not smaller spiritual lives than their impoverished ancestors of the pastoral. They have more, not fewer, real friends than their great-great-great-great-grandparents in closed corporate villages. They have broader, not narrower, choices of identity than the one imposed on them by the country, custom, language, and religion of their birth. They have deeper, not shallower, contacts with the transcendent of art or science or God or sometimes even of nature than the superstitious peasants and haunted hunter-gatherers from whom we all descend. Because of capitalism, we go on more vacations to more distant places. We listen to more music, see more art and movies. We have more museums and we visit them more often. We have the capacity to give more to friends and strangers, both economically and emotionally. And much of our work is more fulfilling contributing to our life satisfaction. I speak so much about this idea of the bourgeois deal because that is the thing which changed. That sort of sweet talk, building each other up, praising accomplishments, promoting the idea that you, yes, specifically you, can go out and change the world, is what changed. In Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back, Darth Vader tempts Luke Skywalker to join the dark side. What's the attraction there? Why would anybody choose the dark side? The answer is control. In the past, virtue was doing your duty, and your duty was whatever honored your family. Set your own ambitions aside. Live a life of sacrifice. Do you think you can do the work of the local blacksmith better than he can? Too bad. Want to open your own stables and spend your life caring for horses? The people of the town will burn it down before they see you try to escape your station in life. Creative destruction means bad things will happen to good people. And we have the urge to step in and stop those things from happening. We want to exert control over the economy. 
but this is the dark side. Luke is tempted because he wants to stop the bad things that are happening to his friends. But he's gained enough wisdom to see the example of his father right in front of him, that if you try to exert that control, you become the bad thing that is happening. Throughout all human history, society has been structured from God down to dog. In ancient Egypt, you were a fool to think you could change your station in life. In Rome, even just speaking to someone higher born could get you killed. And at the same time, the merchants, those who bought low and sold high, were placed towards the bottom of that social ladder. The dominant thought was, his gain is my loss, and there was no opportunity for mutual gain, no making the pie bigger. But then we discovered the new world, and we met the native people who challenged this logic. Truly, it was conversations with Native Americans that inspired the Enlightenment thinkers such that liberty, above all, became the ethos of European society. There was a reappraisal. The heroes in our stories changed from kings and nobles to regular people. Shakespeare has almost no middle-class heroes. They're all nobles and kings and queens. But then it's Melville's Blubber Boilers and Moby Dick, and Mark Twain's Connecticut Yankee stunning aristocrats in King Arthur's court with industrial devices. The way people talked changed. In 1727, Cesar de Saussure noted, in England, commerce is not looked down upon as being derogatory, as it is in France and Germany. Here, men of good family and even of rank may become merchants without losing caste. It became respectable to try and better oneself, to buy low and sell high and earn your place in this world by providing a benefit to others that they would be willing to pay you for. This is what kept the fire going. And it's the same change that was seen in China and in India prior to their sudden adoption of industry. We hope it lasts for them and for us. So it was the combination of the liberty to live a self-directed life and the dignity bestowed on it in our words that provided the fuel we needed to keep the fire of innovation and growth lit. To get a little meta on you, I've summarized this conclusion with this popular format for memes. In his 1976 book, The Selfish Gene, the biologist Richard Dawkins noted that the same logic of genetic evolution could apply to ideas, and he coined the term meme as the equivalent of a gene in such a process. Just like genes, memes evolve through mutation when they're replicated in the mind of a new person. The ideas that will permeate society are the ones most likely to successfully replicate in other minds, to be believed and be passed on by those minds to other minds. Ideas are kind of like viruses, and the ones best suited to conquer our brains will be the ones most widely adopted. Deirdre McCloskey's theory is that there was a mimetic mutation, which started to favor rather than despise commerce and innovation. Her contention is that it took hold because an embrace of commerce and innovation enriches us not just materially, but holistically. It makes us better people. Actually, I think the best example of this change in rhetoric can be heard in graduation speeches. You'll finish this course and you'll finish your degree. And at your graduation, I'm certain one or several speakers will try to inspire you with their words about the unprecedented opportunities before you. And they'll be right. The opportunities are unprecedented and in no small part, due to just that kind of sweet talk.